would be the innovation in pathology. We all had a, an opportunity to review the posters that could be spotlighted. Some of us did it in person. Most people are doing it virtually. I'm told there are hundreds of people that are logged on to this sec session virtually. So although not many people are here in person, I think we have an audience, so the presenters will be able to present their work. So the way we are going to be doing it is we will have our uh, very well-informed discussant, Dr. Lee Cooper, who is going to be putting the first four pathology posters in perspective, discussing the state of art in the field. Then we will take a few um, questions based on the pathology presentations, and then we will conclude part one and move to part two, which would be radiology. Uh, there will be a different moderator, Dr. Dr. Sugra Raza, a different discussant, and obviously different uh, um, posters are going to be presented and spotlighted. So Dr. Cooper, who is the pathology um, discussant, uh, was awarded his PhD uh, in electrical and computer engineering from Ohio State University. He then joined the biomedical informatics faculty at Emory and the Georgia Institute of Technology. In 2019, Dr. Cooper joined Northwestern as an associate professor of pathology and the director of computational pathology. His laboratory is focusing on the applications of machine learning and artificial intelligence in, breast, in cancer in general and breast cancer in particular. Lee. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Dr. Sizio Piku. Um, could we have the slides? Thank you. So the, the abstracts we'll be discussing today deal with a technology called whole slide imaging. And whole slide imaging is a microscopy approach to generate uh, high magnification images of entire tissue sections. And so what's really led to growth in this technology are improvements in speed. Uh, and so for example, today's scanners can generate a 40X objective uh, image in approximately 90 seconds uh, for a single slide. And also storage. So, uh, you know, in a pathology lab, you might deal with, you know, thousands of slides a day. And so we're talking about, you know, possibly tens of petabytes of storage uh, for a, you know, single institution. So those, uh, you know, improvements in storage costs and improvements in storage density have really, I think, helped, you know, with adoption of digital pathology. So digital pathology was approved by the FDA for primary diagnosis in 2017. And since then, it's had, you know, increasing clinical adoption in the U.S. Uh, this has been somewhat accelerated by the pandemic. A lot of people want to use digital pathology for remote sign-out, and there's currently a waiver that allows that to happen. Um, and so, you know, some of the leaders in digital pathology, like Memorial Sloan Kettering in Ohio State, have scanned millions of slides. And uh, this is probably coming to a medical lab near you. If it's not there already, uh, it's coming soon. So uh, when we talk about AI in pathology, it's actually already here. So in September, uh, Page AI was given the first uh, FDA-approved AI product in digital pathology. This is a prostate cancer detection tool. Uh, they did a really massive validation and showed that this provides extremely uh, significant improvements in specificity and sensitivity for cancer diagnosis, uh, even for subspecialists. And so, you know, we are living in the future now, uh, as of, you know, September. So, you know, I would anticipate that, you know, breast cancer is going to be an area of intense focus given the relevance of histology and also, you know, the volume of breast cancer cases that our labs deal with. So these technologies can be applied in a first read manner where they're pre-screening cases and some pathologists will never read any of those cases. They can be applied in a second read fashion where the pathologist and the technology read the case in parallel. And if there's a discrepancy, those cases are flagged for review. There's also an assisted read approach that provides the pathologist a suite of tools that do things like uh, scoring tubules or, uh, you know, mitosis count, for example. So I think that really the opportunities for this technology are improved diagnostic accuracy and efficiency. Hopefully this will allow our pathologists to spend more time doing things that are interesting uh, rather than dealing with really routine cases. 
Um, there are big implications for resource limited settings. So in places like the rural US or maybe lower and middle income countries where access to subspecialists may be limited, AI could help uh, provide gold standard diagnosis for those patients, which is really big if you think about it. I think there's also potential in the future to use this technology to develop better diagnostic and prognostic criteria using objective and quantitative measures. And hopefully we will see that happen. So the challenges, as you'll see today, uh, there are significant requirements on the size and the quality of data. When you're developing these algorithms, you need to capture large data sets that represent the clinical phenotypes, the histologic phenotypes, and also that represent the variability you would see uh, from lab to lab in practice. Uh, there are also issues with computational and digital infrastructure. Once you have an algorithm, uh, you need to be able to run it on the slides and deliver the results to the pathologist, and that's not really a, a trivial problem. So let's move on to the posters. The first poster is from Jorge Ruiz Filho at Memorial Sloan Kettering and co-authors at Page and uh, Mount Sinai in New York. And this poster is called An Artificial Intelligence-Based Predictor of CDH1 Bioallelic Mutations and Invasive Lobular Carcinoma. And so I think this poster deals with some very interesting issues related to ground truth, subjectivity, uh, and so uh, really they're looking at the problem of the profound inner observer variability in invasive lobular carcinoma diagnosis. And what they do I think is very creative. So they, instead of trying to predict lobular subtype, which is gonna have noisy labels because those are determined by pathologists, they focus on a molecular surrogate, which is biallelic CDH1 inactivation. Uh, this is highly specific to ILCs, but not entirely sensitive for ILCs. But if you could predict this mutation from histology, you could capture a large number of uh, ILC diagnoses. So the data they use, they have 1,100 primary breast cancers. Uh, for the ground truth, they started with two pathogenic somatic mutations of CDH1, or one mutation plus loss of heterozygosity. Um, this results in 143 biallelic samples, 957 non-biallelic samples. They also used the histologic subtype, uh, which yields 173 lobular cases and 927 non-lobular cases. One of the interesting things they did is to really drill down on the ground truth and try to refine the quality. So they expand the molecular criteria, including things like uh, structural rearrangements or promoter methylation. That gives them an additional seven um, biallelic cases, and they performed a histology review to kind of try to smooth out those diagnoses. So um, you can see the results are, are quite accurate. So for predicting either lobular phenotype or biallelic CDH1 mutations, they have an AUC of 0.94. That's extremely high. Uh, in the revised ground truth, where they have you know, higher quality labels, you see some marginal improvement, but very consistent improvement. So if you're starting out with a high AUC, even you know, an increase of half a point or a point is, is very significant. And so I think this is a very exciting result. So let's move on to the next poster. This is a poster uh, from Matthew Hanna at Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, with co-authors from Page AI. And this poster is called Subtyping Invasive Carcinomas and High-Risk Lesions for Machine Learning-Based Breast Pathology. This is a really uh, very exciting poster that's looking at developing clinical grade uh, breast computational pathology, analogous to the PAGE prostate uh, product that I mentioned before. And so they're calling this PAGE breast beta. You know, beta is a software term for a sort of pre-release or a prototype. Uh, this really covers a wide spectrum of diagnoses and histologic subtypes. They're listed here. And so this is really aiming to be a comprehensive classifier of not only of diagnosis, but also histologic subtype. And in order to achieve that, they acquired a, a very large data set. So for their training data, they have over 40,000 slides. This is from over 6,000 biopsies and over 3,400 excisions. And uh, their validation data, they used over 11,000 slides. So this is an extremely large data set, very significant work to put this together. And one of the things that Page has uh, really been a pioneer on is training with slide level labels. So, you know, for a single case, you have uh, these uh, collection of very large images and the label exists at the level of the patient or the slide, and it may only correspond to a very small part of the image. And so it's a very difficult problem to isolate which region is relevant. And so they've been able to develop some uh, novel methods to do that that were, were very successful. So um, the results are very impressive. 
For the diagnostic category, the accuracy range is from 0.9 for atypical ductal hyperplasia to 0.96 for lobular carcinoma in C2. Uh, for the histologic subtypes, the accuracies range from 0.9 for solid papillary to 0.99 for mucinous. So this is really you know, approaching you know, a clinically meaningful performance. And you know, these tools don't have to be perfect. They just have to improve on what, what humans can do, which is still very subjective. Uh, one of the nice things about this tool and others that we'll show today is they give a readout, a visual readout of the relevant areas, and so they overlay a heat map on the whole slide image. So the pathologist can see which regions are really driving the prediction. And they've also demonstrated that this algorithm is robust to the things, the artifacts you'll encounter in these images, things like inking or schmutz uh, that shows up on the slides during prep or during scanning. The fourth abstract is uh, deep learning applied on resection specimens, specimen tissues slides of pure ductal carcinoma in C2 predicts ipsilateral invasive breast cancer recurrence. And this is from Shannon Doyle at the Netherlands Cancer Institute where most of the uh, co-authors are. Uh, there's also a co-author from the Informatics Institute at the University of Amsterdam in Netherlands. Uh, this is a very interesting paper that looks at predicting the risk of developing invasive breast cancer following a DCIS diagnosis. And so they have 235 HE slides uh, from as many patients and with 10 year follow up. So that's obviously it's hard to acquire that type of data. These patients uh, did not receive radiotherapy and there was recurrence in 167 of these cases. This approach, instead of operating just at a whole slide level, it has kind of an intermediate representation, which I think gives the algorithm some very interesting properties. So the first thing they do is to uh, apply a detector to de detect all of the ducts in the specimen. And then each of these ducts gets a score, which is like a risk score. And then the patient level prediction is an aggregate of those risk scores. And so what this really allows you to do during inference is to see, you know, which of these ducts are really, you know, associated with high risk or lower risk, which I think can really be informative, not just for diagnosis, but for, you know, understanding what's going on uh, in these tissues. And so uh, for predicting uh, recurrence, they, they used five-fold cross-validation. For the uh, radiotherapy negative patients, they achieve an AUC of 0.81, which is quite high. They also show that if they take this model and instead of training it with the labels immediately, they train it to sort of learn the canonical patterns present in the slide. We call that self-supervision. They're able to really significantly improve performance. And so they increase from 0.81 to 0.93, which is quite high for predicting uh, future risk. Okay. Uh, the last poster is from Anne Vincent Solomon uh, at Institut Curie in Paris and with co-authors from uh, Maccabi Healthcare Services and the Shamir Medical Center, and also Ibex Medical Analytics in Israel. And the title of this poster is a multi-feature AI-based solution for cancer diagnosis and breast biopsies, a prospective blinded multi-site clinical study. So this really, like the title suggests, this is an international uh, multi-site prospective validation of a diagnostic classifier for breast cancer. This classifier is detecting the presence of invasive carcinoma or DCIS. It's doing a classification uh, among invasive carcinomas between IDC and ILC. And it also does grading of DCIS. So putting people into binary categories, either of higher intermediate DCIS or low DCIS or atypical ductal hyperplasia. So this is you know, an example of the type of you know, work you need to do in these prospective studies. They have six pathologists. Three pathologists at Curie, three pathologists at Maccabi. They looked at 436 breast biopsies. The breakdown of the uh, diagnoses are shown there. And they used multiple scanning systems, which is something that you, know, you need to do because of the variability in how the images are formed. So that really increases the challenge. And it's important to show that for these diagnostic AI tools that they're robust to the scanner. So the detection accuracy they have is really outstanding. So 0.99 AUC for invasive carcinomas. For DCIS or atypical ductor hypoplasia, they have 0.95 AUC. And the classification accuracies they have for IDC versus ILC is 0.97 and 0.92 AUC for grading DCIS. So all around, you know, extremely high accuracy. Also, you know, likely, you know, clinical grade. 
So this system is intended to be deployed as a second read system, and so it will sit in the background and you know flag cases where it disagrees with the pathologist. One of the interesting things they do in this abstract is to show cases where there was discordance among pathologists, and then to show that uh, the AI tool was correct. And just like the study we showed before, the AI tool is able to really not just give a diagnosis, but say which regions are relevant to that diagnosis. And I think that's what you want to see uh, in a tool like this. That's all I have. Thank you. All right. So now we are going to take some questions for these um, pathology projects. And I think that the a, um, computer people are going to bring some of the presenters from the posters also with us that are uh, attending this session virtually. So I'm going to start with some of the questions that were submitted already. And obviously, I encourage people from the audience, if they have additional ones, to please uh, come forward. But for now, I think let's start with the first question. Um, someone was asking, what is the difference between a computer uh, helping a diagnosis and actually having AI do the diagnosis? Um, I think radiology is far ahead than pathology in this aspect. But maybe our discussant, Dr. Cooper, can give sort of like a quick summary of what the two things mean. Is this on? Okay. So um, it's a very good question. So uh, like I mentioned, in, in pathology, you could have uh, varying degrees of intervention from the humans. You could have a first read system where a certain fraction of cases are never reviewed by a human. They're just, you know, have high confidence from the AI, and so they're not, they don't need to be examined by a human all the way to these assisted tools, right? So there's really a spectrum uh, of, you know, tools that you could imagine uh, using. And, you know, they have differences in terms of whether they provide gains in efficiency or gains in quality. Okay. Um, anybody else who would like from our presenters would like maybe to uh, add other additional thoughts to this? But I think this, this was actually very well capturing the difference between the two. And then I guess there was another question that was submitted to us. How quickly do we think we would be able to rely exclusively on AI in order to make a diagnosis? And for that, I would like all the presenters to sort of give us their wisdom. Who would like to start? George, how about you? How quickly are we going to rely on AI only? Depends on the problem. I think, <clears throat> thank you so much. It's a great question. And thank you, Poppy, for moderating this session. I have to declare first a conflict of interest. I'm a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of Page.ai. So here's my conflict. But um, I would contend that this, there's no simple answer to this question. Some problems in pathology can be trivially automated. And I can see some of those problems being addressed in the next five years and to become a reality. Um, there are some circumstances where this is really going to work. Now, when you ask us, uh, do, do we have, uh, or will we have pathologists rendered jobless because of AI in the next five years? My answer is a categorical no. There's much still to be done before AI could be completely independently rendering diagnosis without any pathology supervision. But I would contend again, and I would love to hear Matt's and, and Anne's vision, for some specific fo focus problems in pathology, AI will become a reality in the next three to five years. Thank you, George. May I comment also? Um, I think that uh, one step is to have uh, a, a large number of uh, pathology department being uh, using digitalization and which is not trivial. It, it's a, a, a huge amount of work to, to get it done. But then when this is uh, done, uh, I think that um, we will gain and it will be a, a very uh, interesting tool to assess quantitative measurement. And I think that, for example, for KX67 or for the HER2 low um, phenotypes, right. that kind of things, I hope that we will, be, we will have soon tools. 
Do we see anything oh. different between Europe and the U.S.? Please, the other presenters also can answer both questions at the same time. The, the rate of adaptation of these new technologies, is it different in the U.S. than it is uh, in Europe? Thank you, I have, uh, thank you so, so much for this question, because I have had the opportunity of talking to many people in Europe and the U.S. Um, here in the U.S., we have some centers that have really focused on the implementation of digital pathology, but by and large, most places have not gone fully digital. On, uh, on the other hand, in Europe, given that centrally some of the governments made a, an orchestrated effort to implement digital pathology as one of their goals, uh, several departments have adopted it already. Not for AI, but at least the digital pathology, that infrastructure that Anne was alluding to, that requires a lot of work and a lot of capital investment to begin with. Uh, so the, the realities are very, very different. And you can see by the adoption of the different scanners and browsers in Europe and in the US. And I'll also just add a lot of these uh, implementations may be regulatorily driven in the sense of how a pathologist uh, or how a commercial vendor may be able to market to pathologists and pathology departments. And that obviously depends on the geographic location. But there is precedent, uh, especially in cytology, for more of a screening paradigm. There's already uh, AI-enabled cytology pathways where uh, technologists will review predetermined regions of interest and that if those regions of interest have been deemed negative or you know, negative for carcinoma or negative for lesional uh, you know, objects of interest, then those actually may not even reach a pathologist's desk. And so there's definitely a potential paradigm shift in how the practice of pathology could be uh, transformed in the future using these technologies. And again, when we say future, are we thinking five years, 10 years, many pathologists would like to know. Yeah, I agree with George's sentiments. I think the, there, there's so many myriads of tasks a pathologist does on a daily basis. And when you're looking at, uh, let's say, uh, prostate cancer detection, uh, you know, that's one of the reportable features or metrics that a pathologist does. And there's a, a long uh, additional, there are many other uh, additional features that are added in the report, such as size measurements, grade, other, you know, the perineural invasion, lymph vascular invasion, margin. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people have seen pathology reports and, and see the laundry list of things that are on there. So I think when we get to a point where, you know, it'll be some time before we get to the point where all of those features are uh, accurately and reproducibly identified by AI, by AI, but I definitely think some of those, especially lower hanging fruits will be um, available within the next five years for sure. And if I can add a comment Please. also, um, I think that there is very interesting, um, uh, these posters that uh, we have been presenting to, today are illustrating very well the two um, interesting aspects uh, of AI and pathology. One are facilitating diagnosis and the others are increasing our capacities of determining uh, molecular alterations through H&Es. Finally, it comes clear for everyone that the phenotype recapitu recapitulates all the molecular alterations and that with just one H&E, we will be able to predict some molecular alteration. And I think that this is really interesting in, with increasing needs for molecular alterations. If the pathologist can sort the cases with the H&E and plus the algorithms and then go to molecular analysis when it's really um, necessary, we will save time and money. I, I think that very, very exciting. And I, I would contend to the whole panel and the audience there that AI in pathology may be a phenomenal opportunity for us to address the issue of diversity, equity and inclusion and the democratization of biomarkers because the cost of applying AI to an H&E is a fraction of a fraction of the cost of doing very expensive and specialized molecular tests. Should an AI system that's cost effective be available on the cloud that others in less privileged parts of the world could have access to, this would be transformative. This was I actually- completely do agree. Yes, this was actually one of the questions from the audience. Uh, is the use of computational pathology and AI going to decrease 
or increase the racial disparities. And uh, uh, George was saying that it's going to decrease them. Although some people are questioning how expensive are these scanning equipment and would be rural hospitals or small countries in Africa be able to afford them? Well, at the moment it's quite expensive because we don't need only scanners. We, we need storage scanners and um, informatic uh, facilities and systems to sort the images. So we need a lot of uh, infrastructure to make it uh, available, but probably we can guess that the prices are going to decrease, hopefully. I don't think, I don't know what are the other sorts, but... Um, it is of interest that uh, in a discussion about AI in pathology that I participated recently, someone mentioned that in the near future, we would be using our cell phones to capture the images, sort yeah. of like bypassing the need for expensive scanners. So then that may be helpful for yes. countries that are not uh, there, are, are resource, um, they don't have the resources that exist in mm -hmm. Europe and in the US. Uh, Definitely. Um, yeah, to, to, maybe it, could, it can be helpful for um, uh, teaching and, and, and for uh, education. You have to see what happens on, the, on twi Twitter. We, we have a lot of uh, uh, lively um, communication discussion. between pathologists. Absolutely. Um, you cannot see it because you are on the screen, but the, we have a live question. Please go ahead in the center of the room. Yeah, thank you for the good session. I think the summary and all the uh, posters were wonderful. As an AI scientist, uh, you know, I had a technical question to the panelists. Uh, one of the key problems uh, that we find in healthcare AI and machine learning problems uh, setting is the uh, kind of imbalance in data. Like the number of positive samples is much lower than the negative samples. So I was wondering what kind of technique was used during training to balance it? Is it just randomly selecting positive negative samples or any guidance for healthcare researchers? It's all about the sample size, yeah? So for right. instance, uh, Matt and I are spoiled by, for, you know, uh, by the opportunity that Memorial gave us. We have over 4 million slides scanned. So we can assemble our cohorts with natural distributions or enriched or depleted. We can do our training, our fine tuning, adjusting for this very important issue that you raised. So we deploy a combination of these different strategies in our training, fine uh, validation, fine tuning before the external validation data set that always has then the correct, the normal distribution of the samples for us not to over or underestimate the sensitivity, specificity, PPV and NPV. Um, it seems as if the memorial group has millions of slides. How about your group in Netherlands, uh, Shannon? How, how much have you scanned and uh, evaluated? Yeah, so uh, what we said, we trained our data, we trained our model on 402 slides, and then um, so it's it's quite a lot, I would say. We're, so we also have a lot of data available to us, but um, to make sure, but most of the slides that we actually have way more slides than that, but um, we oversampled from the uh, patients who uh, had it, um, invasive breast cancer recurrence. So we could um, so we could make predictions because otherwise we have like too many negative controls and then it's hard for an AI model to really learn something about the case where a recurrence does occur. So that's kind of one of the approaches that we use. I have another question for all that someone submitted for obviously all four uh, pan panelists and for Dr. Cooper who was our discussant. How are we storing all this data? There is a tremendous amount of information. Isn't that a um, sort of bottleneck and a limiting factor, storing all this data and then retrieving them when you need to retrieve them? Yeah, it is a, it is a Herculean uh, problem. I think uh, these, each of these files, uh, each slide can you know, be gigabytes of, uh, of storage size. And obviously, you know, for each patient, there are maybe dozens, if not more, of slides per case. And so uh, storage, you know, you, it goes down every year, but when you buy it in such quantities of bulk as, as what you would need for large training data sets, it, it does add up. Um, there are various different storage techniques. Some have local storage, some use cloud storage. There's 
many different various platforms, and I think um, kind of the and, and depending on the storage platform, there's various security considerations, like you said, um, availability considerations, and so I think there will be different technologies for different use cases, but for the amount of uh, storage that's required for these large and diverse training sets, it's uh, it's something that definitely needs to be considered upfront. Yeah. And, and we, we have to contend with problems like we had this week when the Amazon cloud went down <laughs> and all analysis stopped. It's wonderful. Yeah. You need, a, you need, need some can, to technology. If I can add a comment, um, uh, for diagnosis purposes, um, in the, the Institut Curie, we decided to keep all the images per cases um, like the surgical specimens for three months. And because as we all will always have the glass slides, we will be able to rescan them if necessary for clinical purposes. But we are going to keep the reference images per case to um, decrease the amount of storage and the uh, environmental uh, impact of the storage. Because as citizens, we also have to balance these two aspects. I th that's what we decided in, in the department. But at the same time, I think that at the moment, large institutions, we have to also uh, make data as available. So it's um, a challenging decision to make. So. Yeah. You are correct. How about Northwestern, Lee? Uh, how, how long are we going to keep the data? Um, well, it depends on the application, I think. But I would just speak to the you know, challenges with storage. You need a supportive CIO. But I think if you look in the future, trends in storage costs and density look quite good. And while it's a, a stretch now, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, we'll be in a different situation. So. Excellent. We have a wonderful discussion and I'm sure many more questions are coming in. Unfortunately, this is part one of our session and we need to make some space for part two, which oh no. would be <laughs> ex uh, exciting as well, <laughs> innovations in radiology. So a different team will take over. Thank you very much, our poster presenters and obviously our discussant, Dr. Cooper. Uh, for their very informative and state-of-art presentations and comments. Thank you very much for your attention for the pathology part and please let's all 